So then the rabbit comes through the door and says, duck season. <laughs> <laughs> oh, <laughs> it's an oldie, but a goodie. I always love that one. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, and good day, wherever you may join us from. Uh, welcome to another edition of the Digital Download, which is the longest-running weekly business talk show on LinkedIn Live, now globally syndicated on the IBGN radio network. Woo! Today, we are unlocking the power of visual note-taking in business. We have a special guest, Ashton Rodenheiser, to help us with the discussion. She will share her expertise on how visual note-taking can increase memory retention, improve the way we convey and comprehend complex ideas, and ultimately revolutionize business communication. Okay. But before we bring Ashton on, Let's go around the set and introduce our panelists. While we're doing that, why don't you in the audience go and reach out to a friend, ping them, and have them join us. We strive to make the digital download an interactive experience, so audience participation is highly encouraged. Right. Highly. So with that, introductions. Tim. Hello and welcome, everybody. Uh, my name is Tim Hughes. Um, I'm the CEO and co-founder of DLA Ignite, and I'm famous for writing the book Social Selling Techniques to Influence Buyers and Changemakers. Excellent. Thank you. Yeah. Which, uh, which if you if you look, there's one in Alex's <laughs> photo there, and there's one in Rob's photo of the back. And, and there's one in your... And there's one... Yeah. <laughs> Excellent. Thank you for yeah. that. Alex. Hello. Good morning, good afternoon all. Uh, my name's Alex Abbott, founder of Sapiro, and I am somewhat famous for being called the bearded sales guy. No, you're famous. And I'm trying... <laughs> What's that? You're famous for it. I'm famous for it. Yeah. I'm famous for being the bearded sales guy. Yeah. And I'm trying to be famous for the creator of the conversation operating system. And it's lovely to be here, and I'm a proud DLA Ignite partner. Excellent. Welcome. Thank you. So, so, so Alex... Yeah. Um, you got an ice bath. I don't know what I you did. call it for, for Christmas. Yeah, what? we did a secret Santa what is, as a family. What, what is that all about? <laughs> well, for anyone that doesn't know, there's a video of me and my entire family doing it on New Year's Eve on LinkedIn. Uh, but essentially, we did a secret Santa in the Abbott household. And turns out that Jude, my youngest son, had me. Uh, I don't obviously know that now. And he bought me an ice bath. So I've been getting into this uh, cold water therapy thing for the last month or two, following the Wim Hof method. And uh, so, yeah, Boxing Day, took the plunge in the ice bath. It, it was quite a warm nine degrees on Boxing Day, actually. A warm nine, nine degrees, degrees yeah. 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 <laughs> But uh, the day before yesterday, it was two degrees, so somewhat colder. Are you doing an ice bath on a two-degree day? Yeah. Really? Yeah, yeah, wow. every day. Wow. Every day. Good for you. And you've now got, you're now up to what, three minutes in it? Well, okay, so three minutes at the nine degrees. Okay. I've done two minutes at two degrees. Right. But yeah, so... Uh, I think it's about three or four degrees out there at the moment, and I haven't done it yet today. So uh, let's see if I can do three, <laughs> three minutes. Yes, Tristan. Absolutely. Bicycles for the, for in places. That that Tristan has just sent a freezing cold emoji. Yes. yes. Thank you. We have a couple of other yeah. audience members who have uh, greeted us as well. Uh, James Marlin says, "Looking forward to this." And Andrew James has Lesser, been on. James is a, has has attended the digital download. Yes, yes, he has. Thanks, and James. Andrew Slesser, who has not yet been on the digital download, says good morning, good afternoon, everyone. So we wave and, and we Andrew. always wave to him, and he waves back through his computer, <laughs> but we don't see him. We we presume he yeah. waves back. That we we trust that it's happening. <laughs> and finally, uh, myself, I am Rob Durant, 
founder of Flywheel Results. We help startups scale. And I too am a proud DLA Ignite partner. I'm not famous for anything yet. Yeah. <laughs> we'll work on that. <laughs> so as I said, this week on the digital download, we'll speak with Ashton Rodenheiser, a renowned live illustrator and graphic facilitator. Ashton uses drawing to help people feel connected, valued, and heard. Let's bring her on. Ashton, good morning and welcome. Welcome. I'm so I'm so excited to be here. Thank Excellent. you so much. We're for excited to me. have you here. Thank you. <laughs> and you're a dreamer. And I am a, I'm a practical dreamer. If anyone's read Think and Grow Rich, then oh, you'll yes. know what that means. But yes, I am a dreamer. Yes. We need more dreamers in the world for sure. Ashton, welcome to the show. Uh, let's start by having you tell us a little bit about yourself and how you got here. Yeah. So I usually like to like paint a picture of like who I am. So you can kind of like get a sense of like where I am in this exact moment. So I live off a back road, off a back road in rural Canada. So like sometimes I just say go in the woods and like keep going and you'll find me in there somewhere. I live in a hundred year old farmhouse. Uh, with Is there snow? There, there was snow but now there is i'm imagining snow. <laughs> there was are, and now are you in the yukon like, there's just like a little dusting because it, we had a big rainstorm and it, and it went all away but whereabouts in canada are you so i'm in a pro a small province called nova scotia so on the oh, east coast. right okay yeah yeah so like fishing villages lighthouses that's our jam pretty much so <laughs> nice um i I married my high school sweetheart. We've been together for 20 years this year, and I have three kids between the ages of five and 10. And about 10 years ago, I was introduced into the world of visual communication, visual thinking, and all those things, which we can talk about. Um, yeah, so I fell in love with it, and I've been doing it um, pretty much consistently for 10 years now, which is pretty wild to think about, but yeah. Excellent. Thanks for that. Nice. Mm -hmm. So Ashton, let's start with a foundational question. Sure. <laughs> you say we should be drawing on a yes. daily basis. Yeah. Why? That'd be great. <laughs> So we need to like reframe what drawing is. And that's why I actually really love talking about doodling. Doodling is a beautiful way for us to get comfortable with the idea of drawing. So because most people can get behind the idea that they could doodle. Maybe you can't win people over right away that they can draw, but you can doodle. Right. Doodling is a beautiful way to make marks on a page to help yourself think, to help yourself focus. And it doesn't have any pressure. Right. You can throw it away. You can never look at it again. It doesn't really matter. Right. Doodling in its own right can help you retain up to 29 percent more information. Right. So it's a, actually like a very beautiful stepping stone into like visual thinking and visual communication. Right. So we need to also like reframe what drawing is. It doesn't have to be something left to those artistic folks, whoever they are, or left to the artist or something that you go and see in a, in a gallery. Drinking, uh, drawing should be something that helps you think and learn. Right. So take those doodles that hopefully you're doing anyways and just make them a little bit more purposeful for you. Okay, my problem, my problem is I end up, I like writing notes, actually, I, I also take notes by typing, but I end up with these piles of little scrap beats, scrap pieces of paper on my desk with loads mm -hmm. of notes on, and I rarely go right. back to them. Yeah. And I'm thinking there's a technique here that I could mm -hmm. take from you that would actually make those notes mm -hmm. useful that I go back to and do something with. Yeah, so that's what ends up happening a lot of times, right, is we take a bunch of notes, uh, we either don't go back and look at them or we try to go back and make sense of them. Because a lot of times when we're making notes, especially if we're like listening to something or trying to understand something, 
we're missing a lot of that learning and comprehension part, right? So we want to be able to refer what we've created and it will take us back to that conversation. So it's about synthesizing down information as you're learning it in real time, right? So if you've ever just like captured pages and pages and pages of notes in a meeting or in a class or something, you go back to review it later and you have no idea what they mean. It's because you missed the learning part. And I think by adding in doodles and visuals, it helps you synthesize that information be like, how could I explain this idea in the smallest amount of words as possible and add in a, a drawing, right? So um, yeah. if, yeah, so you could in start incorporating when you're taking notes, adding like little drawings in there to help like reinforce the meaning, right? Whether you ever go back and look at those notes or not, like, I think that's okay, but it, it can help you just deepen that understanding in the moment. I want to bring up something yeah. from uh, James Marlin. He shares the 29% stat comes from this article. And then he shares an article from Vox.com talking about the benefits of doodling. Thank mm -hmm. you very much for that. James. Thanks, James. Thanks, James. Appreciate that. Yeah. So, Ashton, what are the keys to transforming these complex ideas into simple visuals? Yeah, so the way that I like to introduce when I'm teaching, because I'm doing a lot of teaching of this now, like uh, for the last 10 years, I've been sort of on the other side as like the live illustrator. So organizations, conferences, businesses would invite me to their meetings and their strategic planning sessions and their events. And I would be there kind of either in person, like drawing on a giant piece of paper or doing it digitally, um, zooming into something and doing it digitally that way. Um, and that's been a really, that's been a good time. And I've, it's taken me all over the world. I've got to work with really amazing people. Um, but the number one thing that people say to me when they come up, they say, I wish I could do that. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, well, I'm not that special. <laughs> I learned how to do this more as a facilitator and less as an artist, even though I've always been very creative. And I believe this is a tool that everybody can learn, whether or not you feel like you're creative, whether or not you have any art skills or anything, right? Um, so if you can write letters, you can draw right? Because letters are just like a series of drawings, lines, circles, <laughs> squig squiggles, <laughs> lines in different shapes, right? And that's the first drawing element that I teach people is a line, right? Get comfortable with just drawing a line. You can use a line for everything. You can use a line to connect information, to separate information, to show direction or flow of information, to highlight information. So if you just did nothing else, but like draw a line, to help you highlight and connect and make those ideas bring like bring them together. Like, there you go. You already know how to like start it. <laughs> right. So sometimes I could tell people like, just draw some lines, start just drawing lines when you're in a meeting and you're trying to synthesize that information. Right. And make those connections just using lines and get comfortable, you know, doing that first. And then you can kind of take it from there. So it doesn't have, I think sometimes when people hear like visual note taking or sketch noting, as it's commonly called, they think, oh, well, now I have to draw everything. Right. And that doesn't have to yeah. be the case. The information is still going to be extremely important. It's going to take up a lot of real estate on a page. Right. But how can you elevate it with lines and, you know, different icons that you can learn over time and stuff like that? So, Coming oh, into ahead. this, uh, <laughs> sorry, Rob, coming into this call, so many questions, mine's going in so many different directions. Coming into this call, I was thinking, really? Visual note taking mm -hmm. um, with generative AI and these AI based note takers, is there really a life for it? Interesting. Now, listening to you speak, clearly there is because you're, you're adding value, you're emphasizing, you're you're giving your own mind, your own brain, the opportunity to retain more information by mm -hmm. doing it and not rely on a, on a, on a bot. Yeah, yeah I, I think it's like you um, kind of, a lot of times you have to think about like what's the end in mind, right? And if you're going to be using an AI tool or something that helps synthesize information, why are you doing that in the first place, right? So mm -hmm. if it's to learn something, you might have to do like a deeper understanding of that information because just reading a, sim a summary of something, what's that going to do? I don't know, right? Like maybe that will help you. But 
you know, most of us like movement when we're learning. And unfortunate, that's like taken out a lot of classrooms for students as they're growing up. Like you have to sit there and you have to do the thing. You don't doodle because you get in trouble doing that, <laughs> right? So you sit there, you have to write just a bunch of words and try to understand it, right? So I think yeah. there's even like a kinesthetic way that we learn, right? And I say like, that's why YouTube is like the second largest search engine in the world for a reason, because we want to see someone make the chicken pot pie, right? We can read the mm -hmm. instruction, uh, uh, but we want to see someone do it, right? So the visual yeah, aspect, and there's this movement aspect. There's something different than just saying, hey, bot, please summarize this for me. And you read it and you're like, okay. Like, are, how much of that is, are you going to remember is the challenge. Where if you read it, you could even read the summary and create a little doodle of it. That would reinforce the learning mm -hmm. of it. Right. So I think you can I think we can be using, um, you know, generative AI and, and different tools to help us like synthesize and do some of that work. Um, I think there still has to be like us in the process of that learning. 100 percent. And J James made a really valid point. A few comments back there, Rob. It's a shame LinkedIn Live doesn't allow <laughs> us to share our doodles I'm mean, I have to put my pen down. I, you know, we, we talk a lot about being human on social yeah. media and, and that being the competitive advantage for businesses in the future, yeah. despite how advanced AI is becoming with with videos of ourselves. And actually, this is just another way of adding to that. So thinking differently about how you can visualize your yeah. content um, on social media platforms by way of a drawing or a video you drawing. I've seen these brilliant glass whiteboards. I don't know if you've yeah. seen them, where there's someone standing behind it and then drawing stuff. It's very uh, captivating. Yeah, I, and I think like James makes a good point about like visual notes show that you're human. I kind of feel like my opinion, and maybe I'll change it tomorrow, but as of this moment in time, my opinion is as we're starting to tip the scales in AI, uh, is coming up exactly what you're saying. I think we're also like the human connection piece is all is is kind of like coming up more in the forefront, right? So like AI is coming up, yeah. but then human is like also like coming up here too, right? If we're trying to balance these things out, and um, you know, for someone who worked a hundred percent in person before the pandemic. I had to move all my whole business strategy had to change to move it online, right? I basically had to create it from scratch and communicate with clients about the value of still doing this, but in a virtual space. But we all know that people went back to in person. Like maybe we're not up to the point that it was before, but if we didn't care about the human connection and the meeting people face to face and having and building relationship in that way, we would have just kept everything virtual because we like kind of figured it all out. Like we kind of down to a science at this point. Right. But why do we keep meeting? Why did we want to go back in person and people fly halfway around the world to meet their colleague, you know, right. Because of that human connection piece. So I think I, my hypothesis is that as these things are, are in flux and changing and growing in the AI space, we will have more of a desire to have that human connection piece. And someone's gonna go, did a bot draw that or did a human draw that? And I think human creativity is going to be much more appreciated and sought after moving forward. 100%, I'm with you on that. David Esco shares a comment that really resonates with me. David says, I use mind mapping, but don't want my drawings to be a distraction. Right. And along those same lines, I recall sitting in college classes, taking notes, and I would doodle, but my doodles had nothing to do with what was going on. It was right. a distraction. So do you I, I, have any, I, have a, I have a comment to that. Jump right in, please. <laughs> yeah. So, so as we know, we just talked about the stat for those who, who are jumping and we talked to that doodling can help you retain up to 29%. So Rob, even though they had nothing to do with the content, it actually was helping you stay focused and helping you remember information. Because the way that we, the more we engage our senses when we're learning something, the more that information is solidified, right? So like, 
if the if your doodle has nothing to do with what you're learning, it's still helping you, right? The way that I love to teach is just making those doodle a bit more purposeful for your learning. But just doodling in its own right is beautiful. The distraction word is like one of the number one questions or the number one comments that I get. And I like to challenge that with distracted from what? <laughs> a boring lecture. Right. <laughs> well, there you go. <laughs> so if somebody is so like, so if so if someone's creating a mind map, right? I'm I'm curious if David has a comment to this. If um if you're creating a mind map, you don't want it to be a distraction, but what are you distracting yourself from? Because if you're creating the mind map and you're creating a visual, you're doing the opposite of being distracted. You're staying focused. Right? So mm like the, well, the opposite is like wonder, being at an event yeah. and like a distraction is like thinking about what's for lunch and you're off the topic but if you're even if you're staying in the topic and you're doodling or you're making a mind map you're still in the moment right whether or not you feel like you're actively listening in that exact second you're still focused you know what i mean yeah I wonder if David means something that I was thinking about earlier when you were talking and, you know, I have this tendency of there's a good bit, right? Let me write this yeah. down. And I'm so focused on writing it down that I lose the connection with what's being right. said. So trying to balance the note taking with mm -hmm. the learning. Now, from what I understand, what you're saying is doodling can yeah. help. What did you use? Sin sin yeah, yeah. I, I think we have to like give ourselves permission to get away from this having to capture everything, right? So when we type, a lot of times yeah. we're just capturing, capture, capture, capture. And when we do traditional note taking, especially on lined paper, we're just capturing, 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 but you're missing the learning and comprehension piece. And I think like sketch noting and visual note taking makes you like pause and think while you're also listening. <laughs> which is like a bit of like a muscle to kind of work and it takes a bit of practice. Um, but it means you're not going to capture every word. You might not even capture every idea, but you have to trust yeah. that by creating it into a visual and capturing it in a way of synthesizing it, you're going to remember things even that you didn't capture, right? Like I remember a couple of years ago, I was working with a client and and I was doing like they weren't even doing it themselves. They had hired me to come and do it for them. And I was talking to the manager at the a uh, couple days later, a week later. And he said, this is so interesting. He's like, because I can remember where people sat. He's like, why can I remember where people sat? That is so weird. <laughs> and I was like, it's not weird to me because I'm like, you know, it creates an experience. Right. It's just not you're not just like passively listening anymore right? You have a whole experience. You're going to remember things and have to trust that, um, you know, you're going to remember multiple things, right? Because it's creating an experience rather than, oh, I went to that event. You know, if, if you go to one event and you don't take any visual notes, or if you go to another event and you do take visual notes, when you look at it, you might not have captured every word, right? That's impossible, Right. When we put pressure on ourselves, it's just too much. But if you crap captured a little doodle that represented a 20 minute long story, you'll remember parts of that story because of that little doodle. Right. Whereas if you wrote out the whole story, you might not be like, what was his point? I don't remember. Right. So is the idea of doodling to open your mind to remembering more or is it is the idea of it to create a doodle that when you do look back at it tomorrow, you remember what was said. There's what definitely was. like the process and the product, right? So like there's the process of doing it in that in the moment learning and that solidifying of that information. But then the beauty of it is that you can look at it later and will help trigger that memory as well, right? So sometimes even though like I do teach like the aesthetics of them, so they like look nice, you know, people care about that, unfortunately, but you could create a very crude dare I say, ugly drawing, and it'd still be just as impactful as something that might look beautiful or pretty, right? So um, I end up working a lot with people that not don't want to just learn it for the, or learn how to do it for their learning, but also for complexity. 
So when ideas are extremely complex or you're in complex conversations, those are a beautiful opportunity to try to incorporate drawings and how to be able to break down that complexity, right? And then if you're doing it with other people, you could even, you know, be doing it together and then they're adding in their ideas, yeah. right? And then it's very visual to see, you know, it's just as important to say, um, oh, that's not right than it is to say that's right. Be like, oh, that's not actually yeah. what I meant. And then you can correct it in the moment. Rather, when you're in a meeting, if you don't have yeah. that, that visual cue, right, then you're going to be potentially miss those stronger connections or that opportunity to clarify something, which is just as important. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Go ahead, Tim. So, so what's the difference between writing notes and drawing pictures? Um, just straight traditional note taking and visual yeah. note taking. Um, when we at like, so there's like the Alan Pavio's like dual coding theory and uh, I was just like, I'm not like a brain science person, but I do know this one. Um, when you take words, it's just sort of this like verbal plus visual, right? Our brains like both, right? So if you just do one or just do the other, then you're missing out on a dish, that additional comprehension and that deepening of that understanding, right? But when you add the words and the language with the visuals and pair them together, it just solidifies that learning. And there is a stat, I can't remember where it comes from. Some can look it up if they want. But, you know, at the end of the day, a lot of times we want to take action on this information, right? So adding in the visual to the words and the language can increase the opportunity to take action by like 89%, right? Because we can visually see what it is that we need to do instead of just- And, and when, when you say visuals, what do you mean? Do you mean, because if I come to a meeting with Alex, do I sketch his face? <laughs> Uh, you could if you wanted to, <laughs> no pressure. Um, visuals to me is like doodling with a little bit purpose, right? right. Yeah, so it's kind of visual note taking, visual sketch noting, um, visual storytelling. Of course, there's all these different where every industry has all its words that it likes to use. Um, sketch noting is probably one of the most like popularized ones, um, but information is still always going to be really important. But we can add, start adding in like little icons or little like like I said in the beginning, I like to teach lines and how to use lines to help connect information. Then you can use containers. You can draw little people if you want to. You can add in color to show different ideas, right? So there's lots of different ways to incorporate it. Um, but you don't have to feel like you have to now be a caricature artist and draw <laughs> Alex. Alex, like I'm not very good at drawing people. <laughs> you know, that's not something that I'm like a really strong um, uh, visual note taker in, right? Uh, it's more, it's really making sure that we focus on that information. That content's always gonna be king, right? We have a couple of comments from people in the yeah, audience. Sure. Um, Andrew Slesser says, is doodling just a form of shorthand? I never thought about it that way, but you could call it that. You could call it that. Like, I guess I'll go back to the example I just gave around, you know, if you listen to a 20 minute long story, you could do a little doodle or a little drawing that represented the outcome from that story. And that's like, that could be a shorthand instead of writing out the whole story, who did what and who said what or what have you. So that's kind of an, a fun way to, to approach it. And it could be, you know, someone's philosophy if that helps them you know, incorporate it. And yeah. what about the actual, um, well, <laughs> how about this word? The art of shorthand itself. Those, what right. look like squiggles to me on a page that have meaning to the stenographers. Right. Is that a form of doodling? Yeah, I guess it could be. I would call that like, yeah, like visual, like intentionally visually recording something. I think, like it has to be meaningful to you. And I think at the end of the day, it however you want to do it, whatever it means to you, whatever you end up drawing, as long as it's important for your learning and engagement of that information, it doesn't really like, I try to encourage people to share their visual notes or sketch notes with other people because it can be inspiring and give someone else the permission to do it as well. 
Um, but at the end of the day, if you're listening for yourself, you are likely going to be capturing like the aha moments and the things that resonate with you personally. Whereas like I could write, read a book, create a sketch note of it, of what I took away from it. You could read the book. You could create a sketch note of it. And we might create, capture different information because it was what resonated with me at the time and what was it resonated with you. Right. So there's like, there's also this like beautiful, like there's no rhyme, there's no like perfect way to do it. There's no right way to do it. And we should really like when I'm doing it for clients, I'm trying to do it more of like a holistic view and trying to listen for the room and make sure that people feel heard or make sure that message is elevated. But when you're doing it for yourself, like you can do whatever you want, which is kind of fun. So Tim, when you asked, what is the difference between sketching and note taking? Uh, James Marlin had shared, note taking is sequential, start at the top of the page. Sketching is about finding connections between concepts, so it's more holistic. And as you find new connections, you can almost feel the synapses firing. Thank you for that. Absolutely. James, James you're Great. good. You're <laughs> Beautiful. <laughs> he said it in words that I couldn't say out loud. I love that. That's a beautiful way to put it for sure. So yeah. Ashton, I want to go back to something you said earlier. When I said uh, during my college days, I remember taking uh, notes and then doodling and it was more of a distraction. And, and right. one of the things I think I heard you say, in addition to refuting the, the concept of distraction, <laughs> which I appreciate, thank you. I think I heard you say, uh, maybe you can make the doodle more productive. Mm -hmm. Was that the, the the term you used? Make it more productive? Uh, more purposeful for purposeful. you, maybe? I knew it yeah. was a key word, yes. Yeah. More purposeful. Can you give us some guidance on how we might do that? Yeah. So the foundations that I like to teach for sketch noting or visual note taking starts with what I had spoken about in the beginning with, you know, you can, you can do this. If you can write letters, you can do this because it's just a, a series of lines and circles and squiggles and things. Right. So um, starting with lines, I, I spoke about that. You can use lines to make connections, separation, show direction or flow or highlight something, right. The next spot you could, or the next step up, is you can do um, a container, right? A container is to a line that's enclosed, basically, at its simplest form, right? Square, it's a circle, and then you could out, then you can like start playing around. You could start adding in more like icons or drawings. You could turn that square into a clipboard or a book or a calendar kind of thing or something, right? So you can use containers to group information like all oh, this information belongs together let's put it in a square let's put the individual pieces together right or you can use it to emphasize something so like let's say we're talking about coding maybe you'll draw a little computer and put the information inside and you remember oh that was the coding part right or it could be like all oh, hierarchy this part was really important here's the supporting information the the heading the subtitle could be in a container for example, right? So from containers, we move to people, right? And when I say we're going to draw people, usually that freaks everybody out. But you can take a square and a line and a circle, and now you have a person, right? So I'll do it here and hold it up to the screen. So we've I've got, noticed you've got a pen in your hand, Ashton. So oh, um, always I have a pen. You got a circle, you got a square, you got a line, line. You can put little feet. I have little lines for hands, little feet, right? Uh, so now you know how to draw a person. Drawing my stick per figures like always have a stick as the body. <laughs> you So elevate your stick person to what we call a box person because the great thing about a box person <laughs> is now – you can move, usually mine just start with the, like their hands in the air, but let's um, now look at this guy. He's got one hand up and he's like got his foot up and then let's stick a line underneath and now he's like standing on a hill or something. And then imagine you've got a bunch of information up here, 
right? So you could have a person and maybe that represents Rob and you could even put his name in it and make like, like, look, he's got cute little eyes now, right? And like, we're going to put his little, uh, we'll put his little headset on him. There you go. Okay. So, and Rob said something really amazing that we don't want to forget, right? So we can put that and look, look, we'll even put it in a speech the bubble. The joke. Yes. Right. We have a little speech yes. bubble there with little lines representing the information that he said. Right. And you can always like draw something and if it doesn't turn out very well, you just write, this is a duck. <laughs> and, <laughs> and it becomes a little inside joke for yourself. Right. So then when you go back to look at this, you'd be like, oh, right, Rob, I, you know, I have a little visual cue, him. And he said that really brilliant thing. Right. So, um, you know, then you can get into color. You can get into more like icons that represent something. But I don't like teaching icons from the beginning because then people just get like sucked into just wanting to draw icons all the time. And we need to, it's sort of like anything you want it, the foundation to start with, right? That's why I like to talk about lines, containers, people, color, shadows, you know, things like that. Um, and once you get those foundations down, you can like learn it in 15 minutes. Um, you're good to go. Then you can start adding in icons, practice your listening, practice your thinking while you're listening to something and stuff like that. So here's nice. one of the challenges I'm, I'm concerned about. I, again, going back to the days when I was taking notes in class, every word from the professor could be the most important word of that session. But I didn't know what the most important word was until the class ended. Right. If I'm trying to capture something visually, I don't know what I need to depict mm -hmm. until that idea has been conveyed. And then as I'm trying to capture that, they're moving on to the next one. Right. So similarly, right. how can we integrate visual note taking into business meetings and strategy sessions? Yeah, I think there's just so many different ways to approach it. And there's no like one size fits all, you know, like if you're, I'm just going to go piggyback off this lecture that you said, and then we can get to your actual question. But like, you could, you know, type it all out, or get some sort of AI thing to do it for you or something. But I think you could go back through and highlight things like usually when I sketch note a book, I read through it, the whole thing, I highlight a bunch of stuff, and then I create a little visual at the end of each chapter, right? So like, you know, you don't, and it doesn't always have to be live, right? It doesn't have to be in the moment, right? You could make notes normally, you could go back and highlight, okay, this was, I feel like this was something really important, this was this, and then you could create a visual. I have like no patience. That's why I think this work is like beautiful for me, because I like, Sitting down, there's a half an hour, I draw it and I'm done. <laughs> I don't like spending a lot of time on it, right? So, but if that's something that you think will help you with your learning of it, you could take notes normally, go through it for that additional learning, highlight the most important things, create a visual or add in a few little visuals or something, right? There's no um, specific way that, you know, you have to do it this way every single time or something. And sometimes it's just like people's comfort level when they're getting started too. Yeah. Yeah. I'm thinking, I'm thinking, uh, so we've done a, we've had a previous podcast where, um, I think her name was Dr. Rebecca Jackson. She was, she's a, uh, she, she kind of specializes in neurodiversity. Mm. And so, you know, people, salespeople, other people of all types learn in different ways and some of us you know will have a learning difficulty like ADHD and this is sort of striking me as something that will be really helpful to those people that struggle to mm -hmm. learn like you know, tradi you know tr I don't know what the word is traditional human beings let's say did yeah. you see the light bulb go on above my head <laughs> when you said it doesn't have to be live. Right. That was yeah. eye-opening for me. That was the okay, epiphany. Good. Because okay, good. what I thought then was, I'll take the notes as I traditionally do, a handwritten word. But when I go back and review them, especially for students and studying, 
when I go back and review them and recognize the important concepts, I can see we're sketching that out might be more valuable than just simply uh, rewriting the the words or uh, even less um, active is, is simply highlighting them with a highlighter. Mm -hmm. My students these days all take notes on the computer as well. So it, it's uh, mm. having them you think they are anyway, Bob. You think they're taking notes. <laughs> yeah, they're, 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 they're creating Google a. Actually, yeah, they're they're making an Instagram hey, post. Whatever you do, you. But, um, yeah. I I can see we're coming back to it after the fact to study and review. Mm -hmm. So that's great for students. How many people actually go back to the notes they took in a business meeting mm -hmm. and do things with them? Yeah. But now <laughs> you the issue, right? Yeah, that, exactly. So that's why I think when I think live could be helpful in those situations. Yeah. Right. And I try to encourage people to get comfortable with doing it live. Um, we actually just hosted World Sketch Note Day. Yes, it was yesterday. It was oh. a big deal. We had uh, 750 right. people from all over the world register to hang out on a Zoom call. Um, and uh, wow. so yeah, like the the pressure of it live is can be very intimidating. So I'm glad that that resonated with you. And um, I try to encourage people because I'm I maybe think because I mentioned it on the call yesterday. Um, practice when the stakes aren't high, right? Put on a TED talk, put on a podcast, put on something. Practice live, review it, right? That's pretty important. What did I? What could I have improved? What did I miss? Whatever, right? And if you do it in mm -hmm. scenarios that aren't high stakes, then you can. You know, even maybe a meeting is on high stakes because there might be meeting notes or you could ask your friend or show, you know, and be like, fill in the gaps. You can get someone to help you fill in the gaps or something. But, um, you know, if you're in a lecture or something, that might be a little bit more high stakes, right? So you might not want to just like jump into that and be like, I'm going to do this now. And while you're also still um, building the muscle memory for all of these things, right? So the goal is when you go to do that visual note, like I've drawn this little guy probably thousands of times over 10 years. So I could draw him in like three seconds because I have a muscle memory that I know, I trust myself that when I make that mark, I make that other mark, it's going to go where I want it to go, right? So, but that just takes practice. So I didn't want to mention that. Um, mm -hmm. The neurodivergent uh, comment is absolutely something that I'm very passionate about as well. And accessibility in the work is really important to me. So like when I work with clients, I give them audio description files and alt text and all of those things, right? Um, but there, yeah, I definitely have worked with some young students um, and have a, a case study from a teacher friend of mine who worked with a student who has dysgraphia um, to help them, right? So I think it could be useful for lots of people, um, but I think it can be leveraged in very um, specific ways, especially with students that struggle to pay attention, struggle to sit, str you know, have different learning struggles. I think it can be a really powerful um, opportunity, right? Like it's not going to be for everybody and that's okay. But I would just love to see it as an option provided to students. You could do it traditionally with lots of words that works for you. That's great. Or you could do it this way. Right. So that's what I would just love to see mm -hmm. moving forward in the future of like, it just provide it as an option, right. That students could do it. And if you learn it when you're young, then you, and if it resonates with you, you practice it. And by the time you're, you know, 15 years in at that business meeting, you can just do it and you don't even think about it, right? Do you differentiate your visual note-taking techniques to suit different industries or, or different topics? Do you take different visual notes for different situations? Um, I kind I yes and no, mostly no. It, it's kind of like, it's just the skill that I have especially when I'm doing it for other people, regardless of the scenario I'm in. I have a very specific um, aesthetic style that I've just developed over 50, or uh, over 10 years. Um, so people have to be like, okay with like my style. It's very, I, I'm inspired by like folk art. I love like a lot of thick black lines, right? I love a lot of bright color. 
I love putting smiley faces on random things. This like anthropomorphism thing where you like just put, you know, you animate objects and, you know, I like that kind of stuff. There's like, you know, a little cutesy factor in my work. And if that, if you if you don't like that, then you can find someone who has a little bit more of like a, um, you know, serious tone to their work. But I find people who work with me, they appreciate the lightness that I can bring to sometimes a serious topic while also keeping people, you know, feeling seen, heard, valued in a space, right? So it's more about like making sure that I work with people who care about the learning and the engagement of somebody in a room or, or people in a room. Um, but the approach is pretty much the same. It might be altered a little bit depending on the scenario. If it's a strategic planning versus a conference talk, I'm listening in a different way, listening to multiple voices rather than just one voice, right? So there's like a little bit of a listening, um, you know, diff different in how I listen and how I comprehend. Um, and whether or not people have the opportunity to engage with me, a conference presentation, I don't really usually have the opportunity for someone to come up or the speaker to come up and say, hey, change this, change that, <laughs> add this. Um, but in a room where we're doing strategy, we're talking about um, something and multiple people are there, that is a beautiful opportunity to engage people in the process, right? And say, hey, come, at, come up to me at any time and tell me what I missed, what I need to elaborate on, hmm. right? Um, you know, I work with a lot of indigenous communities and they want things written in their own language. That's really, really important to them, right? So making sure that it's like useful and reflective and respectful for who they are and what they have to bring to the table and what they're saying in that meeting. Um, so yeah, kind of depend. There's a there's a few fluctuating differences, but the the skill set on its in its own is pretty much foundational across the board. What challenges have you faced when introducing visual story, <coughs> visual storytelling to um, traditional business environments? Yeah, it, it's one of those things that it, it's interesting from a sales process, right? Because you really have to experience it to understand the true value of it, right? We could sit here and talk about this for a few other more hours. We could stay on here and talk about it for hours. But until you, Rob or Tim or Alex are in a meeting and I'm there drawing it out with your words and your connections and your experience, it's you don't necessarily understand the full breadth of that experience and the value unless you've experienced it, right? So that is definitely a challenge for me in terms of the sales process. So honestly, the last number of years, um, I don't even really market because I just show up to an event, to a meeting. I do a good job. That's pretty important, right? You kick butt, you get results, you make sure people feel amazing at the end. It's useful. They use it after, right? You educate them on how to use it, why you're there, how to engage people. And then there's always a couple people in that room that go, oh my gosh, this is amazing. You should come to our event. You should come to our conference, right? So really like just getting in the room and, and getting people to experience it, that is usually what, that's how I usually get clients these days, right? Because knocking on a door and be like, I draw pictures, <laughs> You'd be like what? <laughs> what? You're not, and I'm no, not cheap. Not really. And I'm not cheap. So I want you to throw some money at it, you know? Like so, you know, and if I'm asking yeah. you to throw a decent amount of money at it, um, you have to understand the value, right? And sometimes a majority of the time, unfortunately, um, even if they cannot I find it interesting because most of the time they cannot articulate why they loved it, they just know they loved it. Right. But then I get that opportunity to explain some of the way that we can make connections and and like the holistic view of it and and the value and how they can use it and why they loved it so much. Um, you know, it's a great opportunity to have that co deeper conversation. But that's usually the thing that I get. Oh, my gosh, I love this. Right. You should come and do it for our thing. Right. Is, is it always in person? Obviously, we're spending more and more time on Zoom calls and team calls and what have you. Um, and you've, you've demonstrated quite nicely 
the fact that you can draw something on a piece of paper and show it up yeah. to the camera but is that the best way are there some tools other techniques that can be used so that you get the same impact mm -hmm. through a through a camera lens yeah a couple of different ways the majority of the the majority of the way is i have my drawing um drawing program on my computer and i have a software mm -hmm. in the back that instead of seeing me here you'd actually see my drawing screen and then oh, you get to okay. see everything. You see every mistake I make, every time I spell something wrong, every time I move something around. <laughs> you see it all. <laughs> is, that a, is that a camera pointing at a piece of paper or is that you actually drawing something That's on the screen? That's me actually that using like a digital pen and drawing on, like I actually have like my computer here is like basically drawing on a TV. <laughs> it's a very big computer oh, cool. um, because I was drawing on like a... I, I'm not an, I'm not an Apple person, actually. Surprising. That's probably surprise everybody, but I'm not. Um, I have Microsoft Surface, and I was drawing on that when the pandemic hit, um, and it just was like ergonomically like crunching over. You know, when you're doing events, sometimes like eight hours and you cannot move. <laughs> you know, so this was getting a bit much. So I invested in a big device, and so yeah, you can see like the digital program that I'm drawing on on the screen. Um, for people that want still more of like an analog style, I've got a document camera that we can hook up. So instead of seeing me here, you would see like a piece of paper um, with all the drawings and all the things. But most people opt for um, the, the digital aspect because then it allows like for immediate share. Right. So I'm done that presentation. I save it as a JPEG. I put it in their Dropbox folder and they can immediately share it even before the next speaker starts. Right. So there's that immediacy, nice. too, that people really love and appreciate as well. Where, where can we see that in action? Is there somewhere like is there you in action somewhere where we can uh, see it? Probably. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure like some. Yeah, oh, some events they'll yeah. they'll share their uh, their stuff on YouTube later. Um, you know they'll see have me sort of in a corner. A lot of times on a Zoom screen, I'll be there in a screen just like everybody else, and then they'll highlight me or they'll pin me. Um, you know when I'm doing it, I have also been doing a lot where they're in person, but they also have an audience online or not, and they take my Zoom screen and they project it on a giant screen in the room. So even though I'm in my like in the middle of nowhere, Canada, they're like, I'm like hanging out in Las Vegas for the day because they've projected it on a giant screen. So that's been pretty cool to see. Um, and I always try to ask them like, take a picture and send it to me. And then they'll have the speaker stand beside this giant screen. Um, I did an event nice. back in the fall where I was in person, but digitally. So we hooked in um, I just took my small device for that one. We hooked in and it was in a movie theater. So as the panel discussions were happening, my giant drawing was on a movie screen behind them, which was pretty cool. That's definitely been the largest screen so far. Um, but because like these okay. devices can output it like, you know, HDMI, like 4K, it's like usually pretty clear, um, even if you're there or if you're projecting like halfway around the world, which is pretty wild. Yeah. So Ashton, yeah. we're Love coming it. up to the end of our time, but I uh, wanted to ask one last question. Sure. What advice would you give to businesses looking to integrate more visual elements into their communication strategies? Yeah, I think I think creative thinking, creative innovations are the way of the future, right? So I think like seek out people maybe in your company who you think um, are like maybe your top creative thinkers and like ask them, right? <laughs> like, how can we infuse more creativity in the space? How can we support you in your creative thinking and in your like, what can you be bringing to the table to help us? Right? You know, and sometimes like that person might need like sink sitting and thinking time, right? Like, there's, there's so many different ways you could approach it. But I think you know, supporting the people that you have in your organization who, you know, would love something like this or they have other creative endeavors that they can bring, you know, elevate them, bring them in, have a conversation with them. Say, we want to have more creative energy in this space. We want more creative. We want to support you, right? And how can we help you do that, right? And maybe that's taking a class or sending them to a conference or what, you know, whatever it is, find out how you can help them, I think, honestly. Fantastic. 
Ashton, yeah. this has been great. Thank you so Thank much. Thank you. Thank you, Ashton. It's been fantastic. How can yeah. people get in touch with you? Yeah, so I kind of have two different ways, of course. Um, mindseyecreative.ca is my professional portfolio of like, I'll work with businesses and conferences and things. If you're like, ooh, this sounds really interesting and I might want to learn it for myself. I did write a book. I published it last year. The Beginner's Guide to Sketch Noting. Focus better, learn faster, and remember longer by drawing your notes. And of course, there's lots and lots of drawings inside. Um, first part talks a lot about what I just talked about. Um, second half talks about a lot of listening, thinking, making sense, and some tips and stuff around that. Um, Sketchnote.school is everything to learn how to sketch note or how to visual note visual thinking, all that good stuff. Got a free community. I got a free newsletter. Got lots of good stuff on there. So, Fantastic. Excellent. This has been great. I really appreciate you being here. Uh, for yes. our audience, thank you for your active participation. To our panelists, of course, thank you for always being here. If you have something to say, if you want to be a part of the digital download, we'd love to hear from you. On screen is the QR code. You can scan that or you can visit digitaldownload.live under the Be Our Guest section and fill out that application. We would love to hear from you. Ashton, on behalf of myself, on behalf of Tim and Alex, thank you again for uh, being a part of today's show. This was so fun. Really fun. Yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> I had such a great time. Brilliant. Thanks, Ashton. Great time. Thanks for having me. And to everyone it. who's been here, thank you. We will see you again on our next episode. Awesome. Bye. Have a great weekend. Bye.